So we're in a series in the book of Jonah, and uh, Jonah for grown-ups is what we titled this series. And, you know, Jonah is such a famous story. We all probably, you know, have heard it as little kids. I think like Pinocchio basically even does a spin of Jonah. And it's easy to view the book of Jonah as something just like Hercules or Aesop's fables, you know, just kind of the kid version. But the reality is when you actually look at this Hebrew passage itself, it's extremely sophisticated. It has something really profound to say to our lives. And so we're going through this book and we're trying to, you know, strip past like the, the kid's Bible story version of it and get to the substance the heart of what this book has to say to us regarding human motivation, regarding, um, uh, regarding God's mercy, God's character, what it has to say about human prejudice, what it has to say about themes like racism and oppression. So it has really, really, really uh, significant, relatable, and meaningful things to say to us today once we get past the kids' version of the story. But before we dive in, I just wanted to invite you to pray with me. Everybody just take a deep breath in. God, I just pray that, like we sang earlier, that your Holy Spirit would fill us just in this moment, God. We've come here not just for a podcast in person. We've come here not for a, a, a play or a Broadway show or a concert Lord, we've come to encounter you, to encounter the king of the universe, to encounter the God of the scriptures. We pray that your spirit would speak, Lord. I can't change anybody's hearts, but you can. So I pray that people would just have a touch of who you are right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I've titled this message, Someone Else's Storm. Someone Else's Storm. I don't know if you've ever been caught in the consequences and the ramifications of somebody else's maybe not so great choices. Could be something as simple as, you know, you're working and on the busiest day of the year, there you are at the restaurant and your coworker decides they're sick, decides to call in and there you are. And now you got to do register and expo. And you you just feel like at the end of the day, if I have to sell one more avocado toast, my head is going to fall off. You're just going to lose it. I'm not speaking from experience here. Uh, You know, or it could be you're caught in someone else's storm, something more serious because you had a romantic partner who cheated on you. And it wasn't any choice that you made. You didn't make the decision, but there you are. You're caught in someone else's else's storm because a spouse was unfaithful or, or someone you're dating wasn't faithful. Or maybe it could be because someone that you love so much, someone you care about so deeply, they start partying a little too much. And then before you know it, they're in the stranglehold of a substance, in the stranglehold of an addiction. And, and now your life is in chaos. Your life is in turmoil because of their struggles, their unhealth their decisions. Could be that a parent bailed on you. You know, you think back to when your, your mom left, your dad left, and, and they walked out on you. And, and, and although, you know, we say different things about it, we, you know, we, we can say, oh, kids are resilient. Now they're just going to have two birthdays, two Christmases. Everything will be fine. But those of us who grew up in broken homes, we know that those storms continue to rage, that we still feel the aftershocks of that parent who left, of that person who bailed. Could be a ministry leader, that there you have a beautiful church community, you have a church that's, that's so uh, just vibrant and life-giving and full of vitality and, and there's such great things happening. But then a ministry leader has a moral failure and they choose to follow their greed or their lust or their ego. And now as a result of somebody else's choices, that church is caught in someone else's storm. Well, that's precisely what Carlos just read to us. That's precisely what happens is that our fates are interconnected. We are in the same boat. And what we do doesn't just affect us. What you do doesn't just affect you. It affects the people around you. So here's Jonah, this prodigal prophet. He's running from God. And he, uh, if you weren't here last week, 
Jonah was supposed to go preach to this city, Nineveh. He knew that God's desire and heart was to show these evil, wicked pagans uh, mercy and to get them to repent. And so he hightails it. He gets out of there. He says, I'm going to Spain, siestas and tapas. That's what I want. Instead of Nineveh, like we're going to Espana. And so he gets on a ship to Tarshish and he thinks that he's getting out of there. But he doesn't realize that everyone else on the ship is now in danger that everyone else on that ship is now in jeopardy as a result of Jonah's choices. So the first point we're going to look at is this. What you do doesn't just affect you. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Such a violent storm arose that the ship was threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid. Each one cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So they're all working hard, right? They're all working hard to save their lives and and everybody's lives. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. So Jonah's called to get up, but instead he lays down. Jonah is called to go east, but instead he goes west. Jonah is called to go by land, but instead he goes by sea. And here he is napping below the ship, trying to avoid the presence of the Lord. And, uh, Obviously, this is a pretty crazy storm because sailors, they know about the sea. They know about like uh, what time of year is good to sail. They're used to storms, but these storms are out of control. These storms are shocking. These storms are mind-blowing. And uh, and five times in this passage, it emphasizes um, how bad this storm is. So Jonah, he's brought this storm onto these sailors and their collateral damage. They don't know anything about Nineveh. They don't know anything about, about you know, God's plan and what Jonah is supposed to be doing, but here they are caught in somebody else's storm. Now, maybe as I've been talking, the examples of a parent maybe didn't resonate with you. Maybe the example of a, of a romantic partner, you know, it, it just didn't register for you. Maybe even the thing about addiction, maybe that just didn't land for you because maybe you look at it, you know, and there are probably plenty of people in Portland who would say, you know, domestic commitments can be stifling. You know, family obligations can be suffocating. Truth is, everybody has to do what's best for them. They have to do what makes them happy. They have to live their best life. You know, each person needs to be free to choose what is right and wrong for them. Each person must be true to herself or himself or their self. And, and, and maybe those uh, illustrations that I use for you just didn't land. They did not register. And we say a lot of times, you know, each person should be able to do whatever they want as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. But what this passage is telling us is it's telling us that doing whatever you want now sometimes hurts everyone else later. That doing what you want now sometimes hurts everyone else later. And, and, and well, maybe, maybe the romantic thing, the parent, the divorce thing, maybe that didn't jive. Maybe that doesn't, wouldn't jive for Portland. But I have something that I think would Here's an example that I think might resonate with a lot of Portlanders, your friends around. Because many philosophers have powerfully argued that postmodernism, which essentially teaches there are no big storylines, there is no ultimate truth, that, that there is no ultimate right and wrong, that each person must decide what's right and wrong for themselves. Each person must, you do you, you know, do your own truth. That's postmodernism. Many philosophers have powerfully argued that postmodernism produced late-stage capitalism. Postmodernism produced late-stage capitalism. The idea that you should just be free to do whatever you want, that actually gave birth to what we find ourselves in today and what many Portlanders have a huge problem with. Check out these, these uh, quotes by some, uh, a journalist and a philosopher. Stuart Jeffrey says, the main symptom of postmodern politics is the idea that politics is a personal issue, that politics is a space for self-expression. And what, are, well, what else are we supposed to do when there are no grand ideologies to believe in anymore? No great historical projects to pursue. We're just individual actors floating in space with no real connective tissue, and capitalism fills the void. And everything, including politics, becomes just an arena for affirming our status and our individual identity. Uh, Frederick Jameson, an analytic philosopher, he actually wrote a book called 
uh, that postmodernism produced late stage capitalism. But he says, I believe that the emergence of postmodernism is closely related to the emergence of this new moment of late consumer multinational capitalism. I, I know this is, can maybe be a lot of jargon. Maybe some people just like vibes. Maybe the other people it's like over your head. Essentially what he's saying is this. If there's no truth, if there's no grand story, if there's no big, big narrative that we're a part of, if there's no God who says what's right and wrong, and each person has to do just what's right for them, then, then, then what it ends up becoming is just this doggy dog rat race to fulfill your dreams, to get the most money, the most experiences, the most possessions. And so philosophers have argued that, 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 that doing whatever you want and what feels good to a large degree has produced this situation where there is a chasm of inequality between the ultra-rich and the ultra-poor, where there is uh, extreme weather events happening and a climate crisis where there's housing shortages, that, that, that this has been a result of that mentality of saying everybody must do what's right for themselves. E e there is no truth. There is no grand story. We're all in it on our own. But what are we seeing in Jonah and what do we see in reality? What you do doesn't just affect you. That, that person produce, you know, pursuing uh, just absolute profits to no end regardless of what comes. I mean, hey, they're dealing with the rising temperatures, and the rest of us are too now. Um, what you do doesn't just affect you. It's true in families. It's true in romantic relationships. It's true in society. It's true in economics. It is true. What you do doesn't just affect you. And doing whatever you want now may affect everyone else later. So that's the first thought that we want to pull out from this passage. Here are these sailors. They're caught in a storm they did not cause. They're caught in a storm caused by Jonah's disobedience and rebellion. All right, the next thought is this. Sometimes those who don't know God act better than those who do. Sometimes those who don't know God act better than those who do. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us so that we won't perish. Here they are in a class five hurricane, and Jonah, headed for Spain, is taking a siesta. <laughs> like, he has gone below deck, and he's sleeping. He's taking a little nappy nap. He needs to catch up on his beauty rest. Uh, I don't know if you've ever fallen asleep at the wrong time. Maybe you've, you know, fallen asleep in a class, and the teacher embarrasses you. Maybe you were the first one to fall asleep at a slumber party, and all your friends prank you. You know, you wake up with, like, Sharpie on your face, you know, just some crass drawing on your forehead. I don't know. <laughs> Well, whatever. Uh, I, I, for me, like the thing I'm always afraid, of, I'm, not, I'm not big on road trips because I am notorious for like falling asleep at the wheel. You know, I gotta, I gotta like roll the windows down, turn on death metal. I'm like praying that I just can keep my family alive as I'm like white knuckling it through the darkness. I'm like, this is not, I'm putting like eye drops into my eye, pinching myself, slapping myself to keep myself awake. I read a story about a, uh, a German bank uh, teller and she fell asleep at work, okay? She falls asleep at work, and she's in the middle of doing a bank transfer for someone, you know, doing some clerical work or whatever, and she's supposed to do a bank transfer. She falls asleep on her keyboard, and instead of sending 68 euros, wonder how many euros she transferred? She transferred 222,222,222 dollars and 22 cents. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much she transferred. She fell asleep on the job, and it was a big problem for everybody involved. Well, that's what Jonah's doing. Jonah is asleep on the job. Uh, there's an old, old Scottish commentator, and I love the way he puts it. I wish I could do a Scottish accent. But he goes, the heathen rebuking the Hebrew, the pilot rebuking the prophet, the world rebuking the church, these things ought not be. You see, Jonah was meant to point pagans towards God, right? He's supposed to go to Nineveh. But here, the pagan is pointing Jonah to God. He's saying, wake up, man. It's a class five hurricane. Call on your God. Like, do something. And they're doing practical things, right? They're in, they're, they're in a life or death situation, and they're doing practical things. They're calling on their, on their you know, pagan gods, their false gods. Jonah's doing nothing, absolutely nothing, 
But what are they doing? They're at least trying to throw cargo overboard. They're trying to do anything they can to lighten the ship, to prevent the ship from sinking. They're, 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 they realize they're in a dangerous situation. And for the good of everyone on board, they're trying to save lives. But Jonah is doing nothing. Jonah is self-absorbed. Jonah doesn't pray. Jonah doesn't speak. Jonah doesn't act. And I think sometimes people can feel that way with the church. Like the church is just all self-involved, you know, worried about its own programs, its own rights, its own freedoms, these different things. But meanwhile, not concerned about the, about the houseless crisis. Not concerned about loving their neighbors who are in need. Not concerned with kids who have food shortages and, and don't have enough, you know, can't, can't even eat the only time they eat any meals when they go to school and then they're hungry at home. I mean, churches that, that have no interest in the flourishing of their city, they only care about the flourishing of their own little empire. And I think people are, 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 are turned off by that. And the church is meant to be a place that cares about the flourishing of those around us. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that when they see your good works, they will glorify your Father in heaven. And that's the kind of church we want counterculture to be, to be a church that cares about the foster care system, that cares about the houseless community, that cares about people who are being trafficked in our city through sex trafficking, that cares about single moms who are just trying their best to make ends meet, that, that a church that cares about the refugees who've come from other parts of the world and, and, and have, don't even know how to acclimate to society and maybe are in, in horrible loneliness because they're just trying to flee from a crisis situation in another part of the planet. Like, we want to be a church that cares about those things. That when the ship is sinking, we're not just snoozing. We don't want to be that kind of a church. A church that doesn't pray. A church that doesn't speak. A church that doesn't act is a church that ought not to exist. And we want to be a kind of church that cares. That cares about the flourishing of Portland. That cares about the good of Portland. That cares about the, the overdose crisis, that cares about the loneliness crisis. We want to be that kind of church. Uh, there's something else in this text. It's kind of the main point of uh, this section is that in this entire passage, Jonah hates pagans. Okay? He doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He's like, I hate those. I, I want God to kill those pagans. I want those pagans to be wiped out. But here he is with a bunch of pagans who are calling on their gods. And throughout the entire text, they act in a way that's more honorable than him. They're, 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 they're trying to lighten the load. They're, they're trying to throw the cargo overboard. Later in the text, you'll see in verse 13 that, um, that Jonah says, hey, throw me overboard, kill me. And they say, no, we don't want to kill you. We're going to row to shore. And they try as hard as they can to row to shore. He wants all the Ninevites to die. He wants the pagans to die, but the pagans don't want him to die. The pagans care about him. The, the pagans are more merciful than the prophet. And this is, this is something that I think a lot of people need to hear because many of us who've grown up in church, we grow up hearing, hey, we're the believers, they're the non-believers. We're the good guys, we're the saved ones, we're the ones going to heaven, we're the ones who are righteous, they're those dirty unbelievers, those filthy secular people who want to, you know, who want to corrupt you and pervert you and warp you with their bad movies and their bad music and, and, and all this. And, and, and I think a lot, of, a lot of people grow up in uh, uh, church attending households and um, then they get out into the world and they actually meet some irreligious people. And they go, oh, these people are actually really nice. <laughs> like these people are actually really wonderful and kind and caring and like they're, they don't have fangs or anything. <laughs> like, they don't suck blood. Like, like, like they're not vampires. You know, and, and, and you meet these people, and then you have a crisis of faith. But what has happened is in many churches, there has been an overemphasis on one doctrine, and that's the doctrine of original sin, the doctrine of human depravity, which is an important doctrine. But there's been an overemphasis on that and an underemphasis on other equally scriptural doctrines, like the doctrine of the image of God, which says that every human being, it's Genesis 9, this is post-fall, every human being is still made in the image of God. Uh, the doctrine of common grace. 
You can see this in Daniel chapter 2. You can see it in uh, Isaiah 45, that, uh, or sorry, apologies, Isaiah 28, that, that, that God is so loving, he's so gracious, he still gives wisdom to pagan kings. He still teaches farmers how to, how to do bread, how to grow crops, is what Isaiah 28 says, that God uh, causes the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. And the doctrine of natural law, which, which Paul really drills in on in Romans chapter 2, which is that, that even non-believers still have God's law written in their hearts. And that sometimes the world actually behaves more rightly than the church does. That sometimes people who don't know God are actually doing things closer to what God would want than the people who claim to know God. That's what Roman, the beginning chapters of Romans are all about. Uh, about. They're all about it. Um, is, is, is that, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, non-Christians are right with God or that they have a relationship with God or that, or that they, they're saved, that they understand Jesus' love and, and, and sacrifice on the cross. But what it does mean is this, is that we should never, ever, ever demonize or slander or, dis, or be dismissive of anyone made in God's image. Because guess what? When we start doing that, we're acting just like Jonah. And sometimes the pagan sailors act a lot better than the prophets. Yeah, so pretty profound. Um, but I just think it's so, so funny here because here these pagan sailors are acting like so gracious. Like once they actually find out that all of this is Jonah's fault, you'd expect them to cuss like, well, sailors. <laughs> you, you'd expect them to be like, we're going to gut you like a fish. I mean, in like the Hollywood script version in my mind, I like to imagine that the captain of the ship is played by Jason Statham, and he's like, I don't want to have to do this to you, man, but we're going to have to feed you to the Meg. And then because it's a Hollywood script, they'd have like hand-to-hand combat, and they'd have this battle, and he throws him to the Megalodon, throws him to the water. And I know you're asking, you're asking, Jesse, in your Hollywood script, who would play Jonah? Ask me, ask me, who would play Jonah? Larry David. Larry David would play Jonah. <laughs> He'd be like, oh, 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 yeah, it'd be so good. Anyways, verse 13. Why don't they do instead? Verse 13. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the, for the sea had grown even wilder. I mean, I kind of already said it, but, but Jonah wants the Ninevites to die, but here these pagans don't want him to die. Then it's just so interesting, it's so profound. I'll show you this Romans verse, it's worth seeing. Romans 2, 14 to 15. When Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they don't have the law. He's talking about the Torah, the Ten Commandments. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness. If you continue on in Romans, he points out, you know, sometimes they're acting in a way that's more righteous and more godly, and, and, and uh, people who have God's teaching are just Pharisees. You know, they're, they're making a big show with their, with their lips that they love God, but their life is showing that they don't love God. I also think it's interesting here that, that, that the pagan sailors cry out to their pagan gods, and uh, obviously they're not crying out to the one true God, but I just want to say about Portland, although here we often talk about secularism because it is a very secular city, and we talk about atheism, we talk about these things, I don't, don't misunderstand me. Do not mistake that for me saying that Portland is not a city that's spiritually thirsty. I think, I think Portland is filled with spiritual thirst. These, pagan, these sailors are obviously spiritually thirsty, but Portland is filled with spiritual thirst. People are going at, after it with magic mushrooms. They want transcendence. They're going at it with psychosilbin. They, they, they want to have enlightenment. They're going after it with LSD, They're, with tarot cards, with yoga, with spirituality. And I think there is eternity written in people's hearts that they want something higher. They crave something higher. And I think in the end, those pursuits will actually leave people thirsty for more. Why? Because I don't think there, within, within those forms of spirituality, I don't think there's a coherent story. 
I don't think there's a framework that you can ultimately build your life on like there is in the redemption of Jesus, in the, in the, in the story of creation, fall, redemption, restoration. But your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers are spiritually thirsty. They are hungry. They're looking for transcendence. And perhaps they've been turned off by the Jonas. They've been turned off by the Pharisees. They've been turned off by self-righteous churches or, or, or by churches who don't love their neighbor and don't love the poor. But make no mistake about it. Portland is a city that is thirsty for the message of God's redemption and grace. All right. Um, verse 8. They ask him, what kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What's your country? What, of what people are you? And he goes, I am a Hebrew. Can't you just hear the, the arrogance in his voice? I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. But I'm running from him across the sea. <laughs> this terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away because the Lord had already said it. He answered, I'm a Hebrew. You know? So here's the thing that's interesting. He reverses the order of their questions and based on what 2 Kings 14 says and what it says later on in Jonah chapter 3 and 4, we know that Jonah's race was more important to him than his faith. Because what's the first thing out of his mouth? I am a Hebrew. His race was more fundamental, his nationality, you know, his political interests. We know he was interested in the borders of Israel from 2 Kings. That was the most foundational thing about him. It is possible to know about God in your head, but in your heart have something else that you trust in, that you value, that you serve more fundamentally. You can, you can know about God in your heart, but in, but, in, but, in, but in reality, the core of your identity is your race, it's your politics, it's your status, it's your economic income bracket, it's your romantic status. You can know about God in your head, but not, but not really be trusting in him with your heart, and eventually your life will betray your lips. It, it, your, Monday to, your Monday to Saturday will betray your Sunday, is another way to put it. Because Jonah's identity wasn't really based in God's love. It was based in his nationality and his national interests. And it made him racist and it made him hate Ninevites and it made him uh, disobedient to God. And it, and it made him, you know, completely indifferent to the needs of, of these sailors who were on the ship. His lips didn't match his life. But what's so crazy is that God is going to get Jonah's attention because <laughs> he didn't want to preach to pagan Ninevites, but here God has him preaching to pagan sailors. God, 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 is, God is, is out to flip Jonah's categories, to flip his script. All right, our final thought as we uh, finish this message out is that Jesus was thrown out so that we could come in. Jesus was thrown out so that we could come in. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked, what should we do? Pick me up and throw me in the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. And then this is where I think Jonah's heart begins to soften. He goes, I know that it is my fault that this storm has come upon you. Instead, they bet, did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea was grow even more wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Lord, please don't let us die for taking this innocent man's life. Don't hold us accountable for it, Lord. You've done what you pleased. Then they took Jonah, they threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows to him. Get this, these guys get converted. They're using the word, the name Yahweh, the covenant name of God. They're making sacrifices. But what is it that really converts them? It's Jonah's sacrifice. Jonah's heart is softened. He sees finally, he goes, oh my gosh, I brought this storm upon them. The consequences of my actions are affecting these people. And that is often the first step towards repentance. When you start to realize, oh man, the things I'm doing is messing my family up. The things I'm doing is, is hurting other people. The things I'm doing are affecting my coworkers, affecting my loved ones. That's oftentimes the first step towards repentance. But here's the deal. Jesus repeatedly says through the gospel that he is one greater than Jonah. Jonah says, cast me into the sea and you will be saved. 
And he saves these sailors from the consequences of his choices. But Jesus on the cross, he said, cast me into the sea. And he saved us from the consequences of our own choices. Jesus is the true and greater Jonah. Jonah was guilty. Jesus was innocent. Jesus sacrificed Jesus sacrificed himself when when, when he didn't deserve it. But Jonah sacrificed himself when he did deserve it. Uh, Jesus, Jonah comes very near death. But Jesus passed through the very pits of death for us. He went into someone else's storm. That's the gospel. Is that Jesus went into the storm that you and I caused. Would you pray with me? God, I pray, maybe we would just take inventory here, Lord. Maybe some of us see the way our choices are affecting others. That what we do doesn't just affect us, it affects those around us. Lord, I pray we would evaluate the way that our our sins, our, our doing what's right in our own eyes, us trying to do what's best for us hasn't worked out. And I pray we would see Jesus who entered into our storm, who came and paid the price for us on the cross, who sacrificed his life for us. Lord, we'd we'd see that, we'd turn toward you. If that's you, if, if you're here today, you go, you know what, I have been ignoring the Bible. I've been doing what I know isn't right. I've been doing what's wrong. You know, maybe you've never known Jesus. I just wanna invite you to turn to him You could just say it in your seat. You could say, God, I need grace. I need forgiveness. I need a new start. I need to turn around. Maybe he's trying to save you from consequences that are years down the line. (laughs) Maybe the consequences don't always hit as fast. The storm came not to destroy Jonah. The storm came to get Jonah's attention. And maybe God wants to get your attention this morning. Just call out to him. And if you do, you can indicate on your card that you want to get baptized. If that's something you've never done, a step you've never taken. We're also going to have some people on the prayer team available to give you a hug and pray with you. But let's take some time and reflect and and reflect on Jesus' love, that Jesus came running after us, that Jesus was cast into the the sea of, of death and sin and judgment for us so that he could bring us out. Jesus was thrown in. Jesus was thrown out so we could come in.